It's Tuesday, March 5th, 2024, and you are listening to Uranium Spotlight Podcast, Nuclear's Resurgence in a Clean Energy World, brought to you by PurePoint Uranium Group. Great uranium discoveries only come with drilling. Don't miss out on the next big one. PurePoint and partners, Cameco and Arano are drilling right now. And now your host, Chris Frostad. This week on Uranium Spotlight, 2024 uranium prices look to continue their positive trend. SMRs get closer to reality. Cargo ships join their nuclear maritime peers. Germany does an about face. And an Athabasca explorer shows investors what the coming year could hold. Last week's uranium spot price remained stable at $95 US per pound U308. The long-term price, however, rose another $3 last month to close February at $75 US per pound. David Talbot, head of equity research at Red Cloud Securities, Inc., recently outlined several factors influencing uranium prices in the coming year. In 2023, positive U308 price performance was driven by physical purchases and favorable news from the nuclear power industry including plant life extensions and increased demand. The EU's recognition of nuclear power as environmentally sustainable also attracted investor interest. The World Nuclear Association, or the WNA Symposium, in September of 2023 marked a turning point, with utilities realizing a greater need for uranium due to accelerated nuclear power growth. Since then, prices surged to $107 a pound by 2024 due to factors like the Nuclear Fuel Security Act and potential Russian uranium import bans. Supply challenges such as issues at Kazataprom also impacted prices. Despite these challenges, the WNA projects a uranium supply deficit by 2029, emphasizing the need for additional supply sources. Uncommitted nuclear utility demand exceeds available uranium, indicating a growing gap between demand and supply. Talbot suggests investing in companies with strong exploration teams and projects to capitalize on rising uranium prices. Adjusted for inflation, current uranium prices are only halfway to historical highs, indicating further potential for growth. This past week, U.S. House of Representatives on Wednesday passed the Atomic Energy Advancement Act with a vote of 365 to 36, voting along bipartisan lines. The Atomic Energy Advancement Act encourages the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC, to speed up development of advanced nuclear reactors such as small modular reactors, or SMRs, and also makes allowances for private companies to advance their own developments. More specifically, the Act allows the NRC to award a prize to whomever can develop the first reactor of a type listed in the Act. These types of reactors include those that can run on spent nuclear fuel and reactors which are able to run jointly with other types of power generation, such as hydroelectric, wind, or solar. The Act also allows for advanced reactor companies to skip some of the fees associated with reactor development. Meanwhile, in Europe, the IAEA's Small Modular Reactor Regulators Forum published five major reports last week. The Regulators Forum was divided into a number of working groups to produce each of the different reports. There were a number of findings included in the reports which may prove useful to future regulators. The findings from the forum include the use of a graded approach for SMRs, meaning that the analysis and documentation required for a new design to pass a safety review should be appropriate to the level of risk associated with that design. While the graded approach has been used in reactor design since the beginning of the industry, and the industry experts agree that it should be used here, there is no consensus on exactly how it should be applied. Another finding included in the reports was how the concept of defense in depth could be applied to SMR designs, meaning that accident prevention would have multiple fail-safes in place in addition to the standard SMR passive safety features. Finally, in their conclusions, the Regulators Forum attendees noted that the graded approach needs to be brought in line with advancements in technology, that factory-fueled and sealed reactors presented a special problem for regulators, and all agreed that there is still plenty of work to be done before the SMR development framework is truly as streamlined as it needs to be. This past Friday, the Dutch nuclear energy consultancy ULC Energy published a report on the use of small modular reactors for maritime shipping. There are currently about 160 nuclear-powered vessels sailing in different parts of the world today, Most of these are nuclear-powered submarines for military purposes, icebreakers, or the United States' sizable fleet of nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. There have also been throughout history four nuclear-powered cargo ships, of which one is still operating. 
This demonstrates that the technology is already there. It is reliable and proven, although expensive to build and difficult to maintain. As it stands at present, the international cargo industry is looking heavily into the use of SMRs for ocean shipping. The maritime cargo industry currently produces 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The International Maritime Organization in July of last year raised their previous goal of having a 50% drop in admissions by 2050, up to a goal of being net zero by the same year. This year, the European Union also plans to begin charging cargo companies for greenhouse gas emissions. The report published Friday found that nuclear-powered ships, in addition to being nearly carbon-free, would also have near-unlimited range, a faster speed than conventional ships, and greater reliability. As well, many commentators have noted that due to the small size of a small modular reactor, when compared to a traditional cargo ship's diesel engine with fuel tank, nuclear cargo ships would be able to carry much more cargo. Other options for decarbonizing the shipping industry have been discussed and for the most part discarded. One option was to power the world's cargo fleet with ammonia. It was noted that to generate this much ammonia would require three times more power generation than the European Union currently uses in a year. Another option was to use batteries. The idea of batteries, however, runs into the immediate problem of just one of these ships uses as much power in one day as the largest grid-scale batteries can currently hold, meaning that the proposed ships would have only one day of power before they needed to turn around to recharge. Ultimately, while the deployment of nuclear cargo ships is regulatory hurdles to pass and will be expensive in the short term, it will be worth it in the long run for the savings in shipping time, fuel, and greenhouse gas emissions. The German political party, the Christian Democratic Union, a center-right aligned party, has announced that they made a mistake in cutting nuclear power out of Germany's energy mix in 2023. And if they are re-elected at the next election, which early polls show that they will be, they would reverse that decision. One of the party's leading figures, which is currently in opposition, has said that Germany's energy policy since the powering down of its final reactors in April of 2023 has been crumbling. With its exit from coal-fired generation in 2030 looming, Germany needs a solution for affordable clean power generation, and soon turning back on a couple of reactors could be a way to do that. But as one CDU member of the European Parliament noted, every day that those reactors are shut down, it gets harder to turn them back on. Anyone looking to better appreciate the value proposition of an exploration company in the heart of Canada's prolific uranium district got a taste of it last Wednesday when Canalaska Uranium announced the intersection of 16.8 meters of core at a grade of 13.75% U308 at their West MacArthur project in the Athabasca Basin. The announcement resulted in an immediate 64% jump in their stock to $0.74 cents Canadian, settling down to $0.65 cents by the end of the week. This is not uncommon in this part of the world. Back in December of 2020, ISO Energy made their discovery at their hurricane zone, with grades as high as 74%, sending their stock from $1.20 to over $6. Again, in late 2022, F3 Uranium announced their discovery at their PLN area, with an initial assay of just over 59% U308, moving their stock 600% from 7.5 cents to 45 cents. With increased interest in exploration investment in Canada's high-grade uranium region, returns such as this may be but a drill hole away. Numerous drill programs are currently underway in the area, including Pierpoint Uranium's program at their Hook Lake joint venture with Cameco and Arano. That program will be immediately followed by the additional drilling at their 100% owned Red Willow and Turner Lake projects. Sky Harbor Resources Limited has commenced its 11,000 meter programs at their 100% owned Russell Lake and Moore Uranium projects, while ISO Energy has begun its 2024 drill programs at their La Rock East and Hawk projects. And that wraps up your Uranium Spotlight coverage for this week. For more news and events from the world of uranium, please tune in next week to Uranium Spotlight. You've been listening to Uranium Spotlight, your weekly podcast dedicated to delivering the latest news and events shaping the uranium fuel market and its critical role in the global energy landscape. Brought to you by Purepoint Uranium Group. Purepoint actively operates a portfolio of advanced uranium projects in the world's richest uranium district and has established partnerships with some of the largest uranium suppliers worldwide. While our passion for this subject is undeniable, it's essential to clarify that the information presented here is not investment advice. Instead, our goal is to offer an unbiased and comprehensive review of recent events that can impact uranium prices. 
Join us again next Tuesday for Uranium Spotlight.